Okay. Well, we shipped out of there and heading out. Didn't have no idea where we were going. We were just going out there. We didn't hear about all these sea battles they were having and Paul the Islands they were gone. I don't know which one we're going to land on. Finally, they said there's a, they sighted an island. And we got closer. I wonder this is where we're getting off. Kept looking around for enemy planes I didn't see, and I was in oil. I don't know really what I was, what I was, I was expecting that we was going to war. Or no, I guess we was, in a way. Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm a heck of, having a heck of a time remembering them islands. I think one of the islands was Enoe Talk that we went into. Well, uh, it was already in American hands then. My goodness, I was thinking they were fighting for these little places. Half of that, to me, it looked like half of it was island, the other half was cemetery. Speed limit, 15 miles an hour, I only see a couple trucks out there. Went to another island, I bought the same as a wreck. Oh my God, I can't even think of that. We stayed there a couple of days and started cleaning up and then they loaded me up again and got me out of there. And just on a move all the time. And I, well, I guess you call it island hopping. Never stayed in one place too long. But like I said, I would have been a very lucky guy all my life. The guys were fighting seeing some bad time combat and everything and here I was wondering, looking for it, I guess. I wasn't really looking for it. I was well, maybe this time it's going to be it. I never saw it. I was there when they had to clean up, clean it up, then they had to move to another one. I remember one little island. My goodness, that thing wasn't any bigger. Than From where we're sitting here, maybe out to the Highway 54. About that big of an area near a French frigid island. There was a Quonset I had up there, and a, I don't know what the heck they had that Jeep there for. But they said that was a kind of a, a, a really, really station for radio. They took some supplies in there, and then we went on again. And well, anyway, they said we was in Manus. Oh. We got to Okinawa. I guess they went in on the April Fool's Day, and I don't know what day that we was in there, but the real quiet when we went in there, there was nothing going on. We stayed there a couple, of three days, or I didn't seem very long. We was out of there again. Then they said they was heading for the Philippines. Holy smokers, where's that? Well, we got there with Manus, and they, the rumors were going on that uh, they were going to go into uh, Japan mainland. They were going to attack it. Wow. Well, I was really doing some thinking then. Now, oh, well, Gilman, you asked for it. Looks like you're going to get it now. And all of a sudden, again, they told me to pack my gear. They were shipping me out. <laughs> oh, it was shipping me out. Maybe I just didn't belong, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that was a good Lord's way of taking care of me. They put me aboard the ship again, and uh-oh, now it was a troop ship. It may be that time to go into Japan, is it now? Well, I wasn't going to lose no sleep over it. Because my Uncle Abel, I say Uncle Abel all the time, he was one a heck of a good gentleman. He told me about everything, about life, and everything. And I still go by his, his good man.
I remember when I came home on boot leave, I even forgot that part, but he told me, he said, Shunsuke, you ask for this, there's going to be a lot of problems, but I always remember you volunteered, you asked for it. So make the best of it. You well, know, when you translate the two, two different languages, you lose a lot of it, but that's what, what it amounts to, you know. So again, got that same old feeling. Well, whatever happens, I ask for it, I'm getting it. Boy, it seems like we traveled for I don't know how long. Then finally somebody says, there's a, hey, there's an island over there. There's land over there. Naturally, everybody wouldn't went over there to see it. Just about that time, over the PA system, now hear this, now hear this. Good news, Japan has surrendered. Everybody was just so happy and wow. I forgot all about the island. I remember uh, the chaplain of the ship was saying a prayer. Then it was, must have been the evening, towards the evening, sunset. Because somebody, uh, I don't know, uh, was it a commander of the ship or somebody said, everybody look to the west, Lord, look at the sunset. Here the sun was down low and there was two rays of light like, like a V. I always remembered that. Then I heard somebody say VJD and how fitting that sight was. Well, I come back to Guam on VJ Day. We come into the harbor, they unload us in a hurry, and uh, they took us up in their, uh, what they call X area. Man, everybody was just celebrating, they were dancing on the roads and every place. Oh, what a happy day that was. And beer was flowing freely and food. And we got settled in the, that X area, that area they took us in. So we joined in the festivities. And a lot of the guys have picked up some instruments someplace. They were having a dance over here and food over here and beer over here. And I just, oh, it was just one heck of a celebration that war was over. The next morning, orders come out that we handed in all our weapons. Any weapons that was issued to us, we had to hand them in. All right. But they said we could keep our uh, little hunting knives. Right during that day, here they said somebody got shot, got killed. Got shot. The Japanese that were on the island when, uh, when the United States took the, the island of Guam over in Saipan, telling there was a lot of Japanese there that did not want to believe that their motherland had surrendered. They never were coming in and they were raising all kinds of hell with the troops. And there was no way we could fight back. At night, they'd sneak in there and steal food. A lot of the boys were killed that night when the Japanese had come in there. And I think they called them renegades. Renegades they were. Even during the day, they had uh, they had guns and we didn't. We had supposed to survey for a road from Agate to what they call on the sea through the jungles. 
there was nine of us guys out there on that survey crew. One guy had a 30 carbine rifle. The other guy had a 45 pistol. A couple times they, we got shot at. And boy, everybody, every man for himself. I didn't know how fast I could run. <laughs> it's funny now, but at that time, I, no, I'll tell you again, right at the time it was happening, I wasn't scared. Man, I was wondering, where in the hell are they at? And I kept looking around. Oh, excuse my language. I wanted to see a Japanese. I don't know what I was going to do after I saw him. If I could hear that gunfire, I kept kind of looking around. I never, never saw him. And I don't know, I still don't know how the heck we got out of there. No one was out anybody getting hurt. Then they assigned me to a guard duty. Yeah, nice going. I didn't like that because that meant I would be tied down for, I was thinking that I had a guard duty on them gates or something, but no, we had a guard, the Japanese prisoners of war that were still on them. Then I got to see my first Jap. Japanese. I don't know what I was expecting, but here's a human being, got arms and legs just like I have. Look a little different in color and kind of squint-eyed and long, long hair, but still a human being. Tell you the truth, I think that awful, I didn't know what the heck a Japanese looked like. I don't know what that was like. It's the same way with the but German, I don't know what they said because I did see some German uh, prisoners of war in one, when I was in Rhode Island. I was kind of surprised to see it, and there's another white guy coming down here. <laughs> well, anyway, it seemed with the Japanese. I didn't know what I was expecting, but man, the uh, no one time I remember we had. We were over there, we surveying for that road when the machine gun fire opened up. Everybody scattered, laid there. Finally, our chief petty officer says, anybody volunteer to go get some help? Just him talking, he started opening fire again and well, I guess I have to tell this. I was laying uh, behind a fallen palm tree. And again, like I said, I wasn't really scared. And I could hear a drum. Like we use. Well, I listened, but I didn't hear anybody sing, but I could hear that drum. Boy, just something come over me. That I knew we were going to make it. And I hollered back, yeah, I said, I'll go. He said, get back to the Jeep. He said, there's a, that radio, turn it on. Tell them we're up here. And here this, Joe Lee was his name. He was from... I don't remember, but he was a real good friend of mine. He was always with me. He said, I'll go with you, Gibb. We started crawling out of there, and nothing happened, and I figured we crawled long enough, so I said, well, let's make a run for it, and got up and ran like nothing, nothing happened. I often wondered, I wish I could have got up right then after I heard that drum. I could have got, got up, and we all could have got up and walked out of there. That old man upstairs was taking care of us. Well, anyway, all this was going on. Finally, uh, I got a letter from my uncle, Melford Green, he was here in Blackover, he lived here. He'd come home and he 
got a letter from him that he got discharged, and he heard that I was on Guam, so he got my address from someplace. Here, we was all the work we were doing around there. He was a MA at the main gate. I was going by him every day. And never saw him. Well, anyway, he said that Merlin Red Cloud, Mitchell Red Cloud's younger younger brother was there. He's on Guam, but Guam is a pretty big island. I used to kind of go and look for one guy out there. He'd have a heck of a time. Well, I, what I did, because I was a petty officer, a third class petty officer, I could get a, a Jeep to I try to find out every CB outfit that was out there, and I'd go in there and over the PA system and holler for Merlin Red Cloud. I don't know how long I'd done that. Oh, that time we was working, uh, working on an airstrip up there in the Ganya, rebuilding them. And I was hauling asphalt, driving an asphalt truck. Got back to the tent one evening and had a bunch of mail on my cot. And here one of them said, Ender Island. So I opened that up and here was Merlin writing me a letter. A CBME outfit up there right by the gravel pit where our uh, asphalt plant was. I went up there and sure enough it was him. Oh boy, we had a, he was at a CBME outfit, that was a real small outfit. They were real good, they let him, they let, we spent our days together, he rode with me when I was hauling asphalt. We chummed around together, we were looking at the island over and like I said, I could get a Jeep, I drove, we drove all over. Even places we wasn't supposed to. Luann <laughs> <coughs> Little George, please dial 1307. Luann Little George, please dial 1307. I don't know how long we had together. But that time there was a, a point system set up like the Army had for discharge. Heard about it, and the guy was too young, and the, the combat service search was, was, was so much, so many points. Didn't have any. I said, "What well, the heck was?" Start reading the bulletin boards again. There was an outfit was going to. Uh, they were going to fix that Burma Road, so I volunteered for that. But a couple of weeks, well, Gilman, load up again, here, here we go again. Oh, in the meantime, Merlin come back before before that time. He tried to transfer over to to be with him, but here they shipped him out, he got his discharge. Well, anyway, they uh, got on the ship. And, well, I'll see some more country today. From what I understood, I don't know where the Burma Road was, but that was on a big, big dry land, you know. Was, I was kind of anxious for that. And tell you the truth, like I said, I can't remember dates or how long or but We was on a ship there, and some of the others said, land hole, and sure enough, you could see up. Here is Pearl Harbor. Bramwell Road in Pearl Harbor? Come on. So we got there, and I asked, yeah, so, uh, what's Oh, you guys are all going back stateside. You know, really, I was kind of disappointed at the time. Because, like I said, I didn't have no real parents. I, I could just think about it. It must be terrible for the guys that had parents, fathers, and mothers, for them guys that had families, married. Must have been terrible for them. Must have been terrible for their parents now because I have sons now, I have grandsons that are in service. My sons are all out now. They were in Vietnam and stuff. It was pretty rough sitting back here. I wanted to be with them, but at that time I, I they didn't know they didn't want they didn't want an old full gay over there, I guess. <laughs> My grandsons are, I got a couple of grandsons that are in service now. Pretty rough thinking about them, what they are up to. 
When I got back to Pearl Harbor, well, I kind of settled in there. Well, I'm going home. Good. I was happy about it. They gave us a, oh, wait a minute, I'm way ahead of myself. I was on bikini when I first uh, left Guam. That's where, that's where they, I went to bikini where they had the atomic bomb test. Hey, this is going to be all right. I want to see that big bomb go off. You know? Boy, we worked our butt out putting up Quonset huts and towers and I don't know what all they did. I was on, uh, there were several little islands in that bikini, I told. I was on uh, Aoman Island. That island was, I mean, that the high tide where you could take a baseball bat like that and throw it across the island. It wasn't much longer. I don't know how many, how long I spent on it. That's why I'm like this. <laughs> Rock happy. But then that's when I, I volunteered for that Prima Road bit. They loaded me up and out. That was a couple of weeks before they were, a couple of three weeks before they were going to drop the bomb. So I didn't get to see that. Here I come back to Pearl Harbor. They gave us a party for all the ones that were on the bikini. That's about the first time I ever really, really saw a bikini. <laughs> well, I came back to Frisco and I came back home and here's the hard part, that was a hard part for me. My people, the whole trunks, they uphold their warriors very highly and rightly so. I do I do if you just the way they do, but they, them guys, the real veterans, they really had it rough. They saw battle. I didn't get the scene of that, but I got the same treatment I got home. I felt so out of place. I didn't deserve it. I still believe that. The ones that saw combat, some saw hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's terrible. I saw a lot of them, and a lot of, saw a lot of them boys. So the. <clears throat> The heroes welcome, they gave me, I didn't deserve. And that's it, I told them so. But again, in saying my language, Siwo Nashi, Eskehawa. I followed the footpaths of the boys that were ahead of me in the war. Again, my Uncle Abel told me, well, I tell you what, after I talked to Uncle Abel, it felt me, it made me a little better, feel better. Because some of the boys I was going to school with, I had been in school with, I had come back and they were just going to service. He said, I shouldn't feel that way because I was willing to do what the other boys were doing. I just, that I was lucky enough I didn't get to see that. Well, it was offered me a little consolation to the way I was feeling, but still, even today it bothers me. Today they ask a veteran to speak someplace. Now here I am. That's why I was apologizing to my people. There's somebody else out there that should have been here. But then again, I'd look at them, they were older than me too, they are older than me. But thank God we have them here. They're still here. I'm mighty proud of them. Mighty proud that I could follow their footsteps. Gentlemen, how do the Ho Chunk honor honor their veterans? How then? How do the Ho Chunk honor their veterans? Well. <clears throat> They uphold them very highly. 
they put him on a special pedestal like when they are used at a funeral at wakes they are used to be carry the flag the colors at the powwows At any kind of gathering of veterans there, he's asked to say a few words. This is used all over. Most everything, uh, anything that we do, a veteran has a certain place to sit. They're honored by have uh, being fed first. Whatever honor they can bestow upon them, they do. That's why I say I stay away from that. I don't know. I, I kind of avoid the powers because the ones that have been really in combat, I just let them when there's nobody else there. There no, were no other veterans there. I try to fill in for them. But I never volunteer for anything. I never say, let me do this. I know what it is. I've been there. I just can't get myself to do that. <laughs> I mean, like I said, this is a surprise to me that, that I, well, they said they couldn't find any better right away quick. So that's, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm apologizing to the veterans here that But I was mighty proud of my uniform. I was mighty proud that I got to serve. It was hard for me to see my sons go to Vietnam. Yes, I tried to go. In Okinawa, not, not Okinawa, but what do you call it? Um, Korea. That other war, that uh, oh, yeah. police duty. I volunteered for that, but I was, had already had a family start at that time. They didn't. I didn't make it then. And so that, I guess that's what the boys are going through now. I haven't. Been, I even volunteered for civilian workers in in a desert storm, but I was too dang old. They, the percentage, the number of, of Ho-Chunk and all Native Americans that volunteered for World War II was higher than any other group. Why do you think that is? Like I said, it's, uh, it's an honor to be a veteran of Wang Washushi. World War II back, where the veterans have always been held up high because they saw a duty that to protect what is theirs, and they done it without hesitation. That has been brought along, even up to today. As much as I don't want my children to go, I encourage them to go. They learn about life then. They know how precious life is. They know how to respect. Appreciate what we got. Everybody kind of got a different feeling about it. Some people make fun of make a joke out of, hey, he's real gung-ho about this and more about that. I think that, uh, I don't think that uh, any of the whole trunks have volunteered for personal glory. It's a job. Protect the homeland, protect the, the ones, the children, the women folks, the old people. 
they're doing their part to protect our homeland. By myself, like I said, I was real proud to see the boys out there marching off to war, and because I didn't know what war was. All I seen that they were, they were having a duty to do, and they're doing it. And I seen old World War One veterans telling the boys goodbye and had to get them instructions and that. And I was wishing that, that I could be given instructions by them. You know.